Day once again, and welcome to Catalog and Cocktails, presented by Data.World. This is a weekly live hangout, an honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with a tasty beverage in hand. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, joined by Juan. Hey, Tim, I'm Juan Cicada, principal scientist here at Data.World, and as always, a pleasure it is Wednesday, it is middle of the week, end of the day, and if you can see my background, it's literally night. And it's really late for you. It's 11 p.m. for me, I'll bring that up in a second, but today we are super, super excited because our guest is the one and only Ben Stansel. Ben is the chief analytics officer and founder of Mode, and he is the author of the famous Friday Fight Post, and if you're not reading those things, one, you're leaving you live underneath the rock and second you are totally missing out on stuff this is like i think this is a tradition now with data.world like we are all looking forward to your posts and then we have we actually have a, a slack channel that we kind of share posts and yours always comes up we have so much chatter about it ben it's a pleasure great to be here uh yeah thanks for thanks for having me awesome awesome so let's start with our tell and toast so what are you drinking and what are we toasting for take us away ben uh, so I have, I have just a bottle of tequila. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, it's yeah. Um, Severo tequila. It's a reposado. Uh, and I guess I am toasting. So mode, uh, exciting news in Moseland, Modeland actually. Um, we just brought on a new CEO. Uh, so we have been basically the, the founders of all still at mode, all still sticking around. Uh, our CEO, who's one of the founders, has been running Mode for the last eight and a half years. Um, we've reached the stage. We're really excited about the opportunity. Uh, and, and all of us are kind of zero to one guys. Um, and so we're excited to bring on someone who is a, you know, one to whatever's next uh, guy. Um, and so I think it's, again, all, all of us are still there, uh, still very much invested in, in Mode and just taking on some new roles. Uh, so excited to that. So, so I will toast to, to Mode's new CEO uh Gaurav Rivari. that is awesome congratulations I mean, yeah i remember my previous company also brought in uco that's that's a big game changer we're all so excited so cheers to that tim how about you um today i am drinking um a cocktail called between the sheets it's a cognac cocktail but um i i didn't have all the ingredients so i used apple brandy and the wrong kind of rum so i call it an under the mattress because it's kind of janky um, and, uh, I'm going to cheers to, um, to wearing a dress shirt. I haven't done it for a couple of months and, uh, decided to look nice today for a couple of meetings. So cheers to <laughs> this weird world of remote work that we, that we live in. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in, it's dark outside. I'm in Europe. It actually worked out. I'm in the middle of Ger nowhere, Germany, uh, Southern Germany in a little town called Bodern. And this is in a place called, uh, it's a castle. It's a castle duck stool where we get together once in a while. Computer scientists get to meet uh, and we have this seminar on graph databases, meet network visualization. So this is what we do. We got 20 people in person meeting, talking about the future of this area. And I'm drinking a really nice bottle of wine that they have here. So the cool thing is that every place, every room you have has beer and wine because the best conversations happen after in the evening. So uh, drinking wine and cheers to having in-person meetings and just talking about just talking, just thinking about what's going to happen in the future. So cheers. Yeah. Cheers. cheers, Ben. Glad to have you. Yeah. Good to be here again. So we got our warm up question. This is in honor to you, Ben. So in honor of your Friday fight post, what is the most controversial post or blog that you've ever written and what kind of feedback did you receive? Okay. So I can think of two. Um, one is probably in line with the type of question that you're asking and one is not. Uh, <laughs> One is actually relatively recent. Um, so, so the the Substack is a fairly new thing for me. It's something I started probably nine months ago. Um, so there's not that much content on it. I don't know. It's like thirty ish posts, which in the scheme of things is not that much. Um, one of the, the one I would say that was like the most controversial in that uh, was around basically measuring analytical work. Uh, essentially, it was making the case that that you should judge by how quickly people make decisions. Um, there are a lot of people who agreed and disagreed with that. Uh, the, the idea to me basically is that it's really hard to know whether or not you as an analyst are doing a good job uh, and you should essentially try to convince people of some course of action as quickly as you can. Uh, it turned into a lot of conversation about like 
what about like doing good analysis and stuff like that? And I think it's, there, there's a lot of, we said there, uh, Juan, I know you had some opinions on that as well. Um, so that one, that one was a little bit of a, of a stance that some people didn't agree with. The other thing that, that was probably most more controversial than that, honestly, uh, it was back in those early days. I did some like blogging stuff. It was much less about data tech and all that. And more just kind of me more in like the line of the 538 type of stuff of just doing like, here's a, interesting thing in the world. I'm going to do some sort of data analysis about it and see what it says. I used to live in San Francisco. Uh, I used to live in the sunset, which is kind of the residential half of San Francisco. It was very frustrating to find parking uh, because there's a lot of parking spots that are half spots, like basically the spaces between driveways end up being links for like two and a half cars. And you drive up to them like, maybe I could fit there. Like how much could I squeeze? <laughs> uh, so I basically did a thing to try to figure out if, if, the city made the decision of you lining up parking spot or driveways such that they actually optimized the number of parking spots. How many parking spots could you add to San Francisco? The answer was something about a hundred thousand, uh, which if you ever say like add a bunch of parking spots to a city, you're going to get a whole bunch of like the, you know, urban planner type people being like, that doesn't change the number of traffic or congestion. There's going to be tons of people who just park there and we're going to have more cars and all this stuff. So uh, it made some people mad with that, but, but, you know, we're not going to tear up all the driveways anyway. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I love how you are just ready to be able to kind of shake things up. So I think that's hopefully that's hope what I'm hoping about this conversation today, but Hey Tim, I know you have something too, right? Yeah, sure. I'm just laughing in my head a little bit because like your examples, Ben, were like, uh, how to measure data people. That sounds kind of controversial, right? And then parking, <laughs> which is also <laughs> evidently a very controversial topic, especially in uh, San Francisco. Love it. Um, uh, for me, when I was thinking of this question, um, I thought went back to, um, so during like the early 10s, it was like 2010, 2011, when Hadoop was really, really, really getting popular. And like every problem could be solved with Hadoop at that time. Um, I wrote a post and did a webinar where I said the ba batch is not the future, streaming is the future. Um, and uh, that ended up being pretty prescient of the future, which I thought was good. Um, although my entire post and webinar was based around Apache Storm, uh, which unfortunately uh, isn't isn't really popular anymore. I know some folks still use it. I think it's still a thing, but uh, that that stirred up a lot of controversy because people were like, "No, Hadoop, Hadoop is everything." So that was fun. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't have anything controversial that I've said public, written publicly. But uh, anyway, let's just kick it off with this with our discussion Juan, today. Juan, so, Juan saves it for the eleven. Nothing PM controversial. Of <laughs> I, a lot of controversial things. I don't think I have anything I've written in a blog post. Mm, okay, maybe, maybe my academic that's paper. smarter. That's smarter. Yeah, but we'll see. So, honest, no BS. What the heck is this metrics layer thing, and why? Why is it such a? Why are we hearing it around? What What is it, and why should we be caring or not? Uh, so I have I, I I do have an opinion on this. Uh, I believe it should be a thing. I think it is will be a good thing. Um, so basically, the this all kind of started towards the beginning of the year. Um, I mean, the, the problem has been there for a while, but the but the the metrics layer itself as a like a concept and stuff started around the beginning of the year. So. Beginning of the year 2021. Wait, I don't know what year it is. A, a year ago. Um, so basically, the idea is that businesses use metrics in a lot of different places. Um, historically, that has looked like like back 20 years ago was we had a BI tool or some reporting tool. We had MicroStrategy or Crystal Reports, or whatever, and we would just like do our reporting in that and we define metrics in those tools and kind of some sort of modeling thing. And then that would be the stuff that we chip off to, to executives who'd ask them to be printed out in binders and stamped together. And, you know, that's the way that we did stuff. Now we use data in a lot of different ways. And so we are still doing the same reporting and we still have sort of new iterations of BI tools that are for the same kind of reporting, but on computer screens instead of in binders. But we also have a bunch of other tools that make use of that same, same information. So there are like analytics applications where analysts are trying to do a bunch of analysis on data that's not just on reporting, but trying to understand what's going on. Uh, there's experimentation platforms, there's ML and AI platforms. There's a lot of tools that use metrics for marketing automation or for other things that are like sort of operational support. And so what ends up happening is, and within the BI tools themselves, metrics get sort of shared around in a lot of different dashboards and stuff like that. What's ended up happening is all those metrics get defined differently. So you want to look at the number of new leads that we bring in every month, because that's probably something to drive like 
some sort of demand gen ad spend, it's probably something that an exec's going to want to look at at a dashboard. It's probably something that you're going to want to look at uh, on the sales side to understand kind of what your pipeline will look like. Those things, if they get defined in different places, all will end up looking a little bit different because it's not easy to define what a lead actually is. Like some people will say, well, a lead is a company. Some will say it's a person. Some will just say it's a distinct person. Some will say it's a device. Um, and so you end up in these fights where it's constantly like people bickering over what number is right, or they're making decisions on things that are slightly different reflections of reality and nobody knows what's going on. The idea of the metrics layer is basically, can we standardize that somewhere upstream of all these tools such that they can draw from the same definitions instead of having to define themselves? Um, so much in the way that, you know, it used to be basically that we would log data and every sort of tool would have their own warehousing where you have like warehousing for Google Analytics and warehousing for your BI tool and warehousing for everything else. Now we all sort of read off of a central warehouse. Then DBT put kind of a, a sort of semantic layer over the top of that, where basically we can now instead of reading off of raw tables, we read off of like model tables. The metrics layer is essentially an extension of that, which is rather than reading off of tables, what if we say like the database or something that sort of presents as the database uh, also has a concept of how to like compute metrics that we can all read off of as well. So it's essentially moving for more logic into a centralized place and allowing things to fork off of, off of that logic sort of further downstream of its computation rather than at raw data. And then everybody sort of applies their own metrics formulas in, in their individual application. So I know that a lot of folks look at platforms like Looker and they look at mm -hmm. like the LookML layer, right? And they say, you know, hey, that's kind of like the metrics layer. Um, you know, do you, do you see that like things like Looker and LookML kind of started getting people thinking about this problem in new ways, maybe at least as part of the modern data stack and, and, and start to get people thinking like, oh, wait a second, maybe, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe we should be doing more around this. Or do you think kind of this, this came up in, in some other ways? So, well, I'm, I'm sure it's come up in other ways. I mean, so, so the, the, the one look ML is basically this and look ML is a metrics layer of essentially, except it's just accessible to looker as opposed to everything else, which is right. part of the reason it's not a metrics layer. It's just part of the BI tool. So like the concept of a way to define metrics in some standardized way is by no means a new thing that's been around since, since the early nineties, essentially. Um, and probably before that, but like BI is, is kind of a current <laughs> form roughly has been around for like 30 years. The, in terms of like Looker specifically, so one is LookML actually a metrics there? Maybe. So Looker is making some motions that maybe they will actually pull Looker out of LookML or LookML out of Looker. They have this integration with Tableau that essentially makes like LookML just a metrics layer that is independent of the application that's on top of it. Little unclear what that actually is and where that's going to go, but like that could look the same. The other metrics layers uh, tools, so tools like Transform, which are essentially like that's what Transform is basically is LookML. Like if you look at what Transform is, it's very similar to LookML. They do some things differently that, that they would tell you is better, um, but it's you know kind of conceptually the same. In terms of was Looker like the inspiration for this? I, like yes and no. I think no in that, that tools like Transform came out of Airbnb. Um, other companies had built things that essentially do this. So Airbnb built a product called Minerva, which was more of a like metric store for experimentation um, rather than sort of a BI kind of metric store, but but the Transform folks have sort of extended that to, to be something bigger. Uh, Uber built a similar sort of thing. So Uber had an internal tool called Umetric, um, which they've written a blog about that does something similar. Um, as for like the metrics layer as a term, so I, I wrote a post about this in April, maybe April, May, um, which is where that term actually came from. And that that original post, that idea came from I think it might have actually come from Looker. It might have been like, so Mode is a product that's competitive with Looker. I spent some time thinking about Looker, sort of thinking about how Looker works and doesn't work, and then realizing, hey, this thing, this look and melt thing is pretty good, but it's not good by itself and stuff like that um, may have actually been what, what ultimately led me to get to that. So in some ways, like the term is actually derivative of Looker, but the concept is like, a, as a, in practice, is, is extends at least before Looker or kind of in around the same time. It's also, I think, worth pointing out that, that sort of, Contemporaneously, uh, folks at Base Case Capital, um, which is a small VC, wrote a post called Headless BI, which is essentially presenting the same the same idea uh, in like January of last year. 
Yeah, like headless BI is an interesting one, and actually, uh, in my notes here, I wanna I wanna come back to that one because there's a little bit of an interesting conversation to be had around like which parts of the stack does this make sense to live in, and you know, and 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 sort of how does this relate to other concepts that have started to become a little bit buzzy the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Before we get into that, though. Just, you know, while we're introducing this metrics layer really quick, I'll, I'll throw one example out there. And I'm curious if this resonates and if you're like, yep, like that's kind of the problem we're trying to solve with the metrics layer. Or if you're like, actually, you know, there's a little nuance I would paint onto that. Um, and so for those who are listening, you know, one example that always comes in my head is this idea of like customers, right? Like how many customers do we have? Well, and then you, so there's a, there's a definition to that and there's a way to calculate that. And there's like, where do you go to get that data and how do you interpret it to get to that answer? But then you start to layer on it. Right. And maybe that's where like the layering kind of starts to come in around metrics layer is like, what about active customers? Right. Well, what does that mean when we say active? Right. What about like daily active versus monthly active versus truly active versus maybe active? Uh, And then you start to get into things like active and current like, oh what does it mean for them to be current like they're current on their payments and things like that um so i just bring that up as like a potential example a little microcosm here like what is that are you like yes like metrics layer is aimed at that or do you paint some nuance on that the, yeah that basically that's the, the way that the way that i think of this and and again how i kind of how this came like my head came around on this was that you end up asking a bunch of these questions that are small deviations of the same thing. Um, and it's stuff like current active customers. It's stuff like, I want to look at active customers by week, by month. There are lots of different ways that you can compute that differently. So even just looking at like something like daily active users, it's all right. What is a day? What is active? What is an active user? And what is a use? Like all those things are kind of unclear. And, and for the most part, people don't care. For the most part, people want a consistent answer. They don't really care. Like, is it computed by Pacific time or by Eastern time or by London time or by whatever time zone Juan's in? Doesn't really matter. People just want to know that it's the same every for everybody who's looking at it. And and to me, it's like a lot of it is the, the governance around that, where the frustration is you go into a meeting and you see two daily active user numbers and they're a little bit different and they're not materially different such that it matters what you do with it, but it's like, why are these things wrong? Can I trust any of it? If they don't say the same thing, then I can't believe it. And you eventually figure out it's just like, oh, they're computed on different time zones, or you know, this one counts emails and this one counts accounts, or this one counts like active users as people, and this one counts active accounts as like if they or, have more. Or this one's accounts. a real time number and the other one is calculated exactly. every hour, right? And and like those are not useful conversations. They are useful conversations only insofar as they generate more trust in the data that you're looking at and like make people say, okay, I can actually believe this sort of reality you're presenting to me, but they are not useful conversations. We don't make better decisions because of that. We just spend a bunch of time trying to figure out if we can actually trust the thing we're looking at. And so part of what to me, like the point of all of this is to say, let's let's get out of those conversations. Let's define it in one place and just accept this is our number for daily active users. This is how we do it. And if you want to change it to weekly, like, all those other definitions of what active means, what a user means, just kind of come along with you and the metrics layer figures out, okay, here's how we do the aggregation from day to week or whatever. So a lot of it to me is around like, just be consistent. Consistency is more important than like the precision of exactly your definition in most cases. There are obviously some exceptions and stuff like that, but overwhelmingly we just want to look at the same stuff and and not worry that much about exactly how this stuff is defined. Like that, that kind of pedantic stuff is something the analysts love to debate, but nobody else cares about. I, I love how you're being pragmatic. And I think this is one of the things that we need to start doing because I, I've been part of these conversations that are like, look, why are we having this debate? Let's just make a decision and go forward with that. And let's everybody know that that's a decision at the end of the day. If, if, if you're calculating uh, time based, the, the day is based on Pacific versus Eastern, whatever. Okay. Let's let make sure everybody knows about that. So I, I like being that being very pragmatic now continuing on being this pragmatic what does this actually look like or how do you think about it so because if, because if you look at look ml right that's an actual language right so mm-hmm. so there's a syntax around that right is 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 a metric layer how do you how do you foresee implementing a metric layer is this going to be another language which is going to be a standard language similar to look ml or is this going to be just maybe we can just use dbt maybe it's just everything in sql and it's and dbt is a wrapper and effectively all you want is sql 
I mean, how, how do you pragmatically look at and see this? Yeah, so, so there, there are two two major sort of forks that it seems like this this concept has gone down. Um, there is the, the LookML fork, and then there is the DBT fork. The LookML fork is, it's a configuration, and essentially it's a model. It is, the, it's defining relationships, like transform is very much modeled after, um, after what uh, LookML is, where you have, it's a big YAML file where you're defining relationships and sort of like writing little sort of SQL snippets to compute metrics and stuff. Transform again does a little bit differently than, than Looker. I think the primary difference between the two is that Looker is very much oriented around like a leftmost table. So you're essentially saying, this is the leftmost table. These are how you join things onto it. And you sort of fan out from there. Transform takes a little bit more of like a, conceptualize your model, define the relationships. There is no leftmost table. It's all just like relationships. And then we figure out what to do from there. But that's like a very sort of tactical difference. The point is, it is a language. It is a language, like a configuration language. It's a bunch of YAML. Is there a standard around that? I, maybe. I don't know. Like, it doesn't feel like there's a standard in the sense that we all come together and shake hands and like, you know, stand in front of a bunch of flags and say, this is the new standard. But it's possible that one of those things becomes such a standard that that that's what everybody sort of learns. Um, you could imagine that being LookML. You could imagine it being Transform. You could imagine it being Malloy, which is this like open source looker that the that um, Lloyd Tab just released, and, and it's like a little bit unclear to me what like all right, kind of competitive with Looker, I think I don't know, um, but it's kind of an open. It's like a metricsy layer thing, but kind of more LookML ish. But anyway, that's all one camp. Could it work? I guess, maybe, I don't know. People don't love writing LookML. They like what they get out of the other end. So if it's valuable enough and it's not sort of attached to just Looker, then yeah, I can see that working. But like, that is a language to learn. The other approach seems to be DBT. DBT is taking a very like, as in sort of traditional DBT fashion, very SQL heavy first, like it's SQL sort of pure SQL-ish. The difference is the way they sort of handle, because it's not just defining tables, they have to define sort of how do you dynamically compute those tables. It's wrapped in a lot of Jenja. Um, and so Jinja is basically just like templating for, C I mean, it's, it's, it's a templating language for, for Python, but they use it as a templating language for SQL. Um, so you can sort of say like, you know, if this thing run the SQL block, if this other thing, it gives you control flow. The, the upside of that is it's like a little bit more accessible than something like a modeling language. It's, it's more like writing code and not configuration. Um, the way that they would describe it, which I think is, is sort of fair is it's like a it's like html like you are basically like in the same way that you you define stuff to generate html that's like react and javascript effectively like you're doing the same thing for sql so it's like a way to generate sql and you're writing like a configure like a, a language to be able to do that so they are like the react for sql okay if it kind of could buy that the downside of that is jinja has a long way to go to make that work um Whereas like one of the things I like about DBT a lot is when you define models in DBT and I was just doing this immediately before this call was looking at someone that a model somebody had written, I can just read the SQL query. There is no sort of weird black box. And with something like LookML or Transform, which is configuration, you're not exactly sure what's going to happen out the other end. Like you can't just look at the code and see what runs. You sort of configure it and then push run and then hope the thing that gets spit out the other end makes sense. And you can look at the machine generated SQL query, but like, my God, it looks like a machine generated SQL query. DBT, it just says, write the query. You can understand that. So it's much easier to kind of get your head around. Once you start wrapping enough ginger around that, it starts to do this, like you start to have the same problem where, yeah, okay, you're not, it's not a configuration language, but you have all of these, like, you're not exactly sure how you get to the query that you actually wrote. Like you have a bunch of ginger and then some SQL and then this giant SQL query that comes off the other end. And you're like, I don't really know what I did here. So the point is it's ultimately all like, it is a little bit of a different language. It's going to become kind of black boxy. Is it better to do that with a template? Is it better to do that with like a templating language? I don't know. I don't know. Like we'll find out, I guess. It's this is interesting be because, it. because part of, let's say like the, the academic in me and the, the database theoretician that I'm somewhat, sometimes I consider myself is this should be all declarative, right? Well, this is all rules, right? Because declarative lets me be able to kind of reason about this, infer things about this, figure out kind of how to go combine things mm -hmm. together. The moment that you start doing all this templating and if then like you're mixing basically SQL as one language plus some other language in there, you're making some weird piece of crap that can be so confusing to be able to go hard to go parse and understand what's really going on that then you might as well just end up writing that in some other scripting language which people go do. So, and then 
and, and, then, and then now we're thinking about uh, we want to go catalog this stuff and like, okay, we, we can go so not to go parse, not to a sequel, but this other weird stuff people are doing. So you're embedding these semantics, this meaning of things all over the place. And, and I don't know, that's the type of stuff that I get worried that is going to that, I don't know, effectively, don't, couldn't we be doing this already like in, in, in PLC core? I mean, we're writing store procedures. We're just happening to go do it somewhere else and we're reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I mean, for like we're all reinventing the wheel all the time. So yeah, like for sure. Um, my my take is I, I think it's kind of the same. I mean, I think like if if we just so given the choice between the DBT and the LookML version of this, I am biased towards the DBT one because I think it's like closer to something you can understand, and it it has a lower sort of start problem. Like one of the problems with like LookML or, or that kind of modeling thing is you got to model a whole bunch of stuff before it's useful. You can't just be like, here's one metric. I wrote a SQL query, I'm done. Um, DBT in theory, which their, their version of this is not out yet. So we'll see, but in theory, it's like an easier thing to get started. And I think that's one of the reasons like DBT as a product and its original inc uh, incarnation was successful. That changes if you start to layer a ton of Jinja on top of it. And my, my belief is that that's not what's going to happen. Like, that's how it will start. But to your point of like, couldn't we just do that in another language that's better designed for it? Yeah. And I think that's probably where it goes. It's like, you're right. Like you have a bunch of if statements and a bunch of control flow that's confusing and sort of you lose the declarative element of it. Now you don't know what's going on. True. But all of programming is like most programming is that. And yeah. so it seems like we just figure out a way to like Jinja is like a kind of it, it's kind of a janky way of doing it because it's not really what it's designed for. But that doesn't mean there isn't a way that isn't cleaner. Like you could just write clearer Python, basic. Like Jen just kind of Python embedded in templating stuff. You could just write like clearer Python in a way that this works much better. Like, you know, you could look at Rails as in like an HTML. It's not quite this, but like Rails is kind of an HTML generation language. You could kind of say like, well, that's messy, but they did a good enough job of basically writing it. And like Ruby is a good enough language that people don't have that problem. Um, and eventually like, that's a pretty good framework for building an application. You could probably say the same thing about that's a pretty good framework for writing a SQL query. Jinja is not gonna get us there, but could adaptations of it? Yeah, sure, I think so. Yeah. But one, one of the things I want us to get into is on the modeling aspect. And I think mm -hmm. this is this is something that, that I think is an opportunity right now for us to really start thinking about these, I mean, you brought them up, like these entities, right? These concepts, because at the end of the day, I believe that uh, defining these concepts is something that I mean much easier, right? Now, this is my, my hypothesis right now. It's much easier yeah. than starting to go define what these metrics are because these metrics, frankly, are just calculations. You're going to do some sort of math with if then statements and stuff like that. So if we start to go focus on defining what these core concepts are, like let's go define what is a customer thing. Let's go find what, what active means. And then you can start compiling these things together. And then later on, you can start adding the, you can start even separating more what the, the, the calculations are. Because I am afraid, and I, I, I will bet, I will bet right now that if we start, if we jump into the metrics like this, we're going to start writing some DBT thing that looks great, but then we're just starting to start expanding it with more stuff. And then suddenly you just have this weird piece of code that I would really wish we could start separating kind of not just the metrics layer, but also kind of the semantic conceptual entity layer. Mm -hmm. So th that's my quick rant here, but kind of just to pose you a question is, how much it, how much modeling should we really be thinking up front? I think it, we should do, we should, there's a fair amount that we should be thinking about it. I'm curious what you have to say. So I think it depends on your definition of modeling. Um, so th there was an interesting post that somebody wrote, I think it was a, the CTO at ThoughtSpot who was kind of like, it was a little bit like metrics layers had a ways to go. Um, we still have some stuff to figure out, uh, which is true. Um, it's like a year old concept. Uh, and also ThoughtSpot is a company that embeds a metrics layer. So they would have an opinion. Um, the, the, I mean, in fairness, this, like it was a good post and it was a post that was not like anti this. It was, it was just a little bit of like, let's hold our horses a little bit on this. Um, there, his point was basically what you're saying, which is like, there are a few different things that this could mean. It could mean sort of basic, like calculate, like essentially basic formulas for revenue equals sum of amount from this table. It could mean sort of a full semantic modeling. Um, and I don't remember the third one. It may have been like, there was an intermediate step of some sort of like computation thing or something. 
but the question is basically like, can you do this without modeling? Like modeling in a in a classic BI defined relationships. This is one to many. This is one to one. These are the joint keys. All that sort of stuff. My belief, and this is based on me not having attempted this, but just like wanting to believe. Uh, my belief is we can, and DBT is in some ways a reflection of that. So like DBT is a modeling layer, but their 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 con concept of a model is build a bunch of tables, not define a bunch of relationships. And purists will tell you like, that's not right. Like you should be defining these relationships. You define it, the giant model, you model the universe once and you can do anything you want with it. Whereas DBT is just like pulling out individual pieces and presenting them one at a time. And like, that is an inefficient way of going about it, which like, yes, okay, that is true. However, I think one, you don't like want to actually model everything. Like you don't actually want to present every, you don't need a full model of the world. You need to just understand some concepts, like a few concepts, like these core entities are important, not the entire model of everything. Second is businesses are complicated and you can't model the whole thing. Um, like it just like you could make this huge giant relationship model where everything is defined, but you can't really do it. And Looker doesn't really encourage you to do this anywhere. They kind of encourage you to just make things like discrete models. So like, it, it feels to me like there's a little bit of a desire and I, it's a reasonable desire to say like, let's model everything and do this in the right way. And then all of this other stuff, the entities, the metrics, the whole thing kind of fall out of it if we model it correctly. And like, I think that's true, but it's really hard to model it that way. And if the point is ultimately to provide some value, it's like, why don't you just create the entities that are important, the metrics that are important. And if they're not all modeled in like this perfect sort of one model rule them all, we can still be something, do something that's really valuable there. So, you know, maybe not and maybe that ends up being too duplicative maybe it ends up being like dbt has too many entities and metrics and the whole thing is like hard to get your head around and certainly some dbt projects become that way um but it it still feels like there is enough value that can be created there quickly enough that that is a reasonable approach than saying hey we're gonna like model the universe and then have automatically so much stuff that comes out the other end like i think that's just a difficult a, a difficult path to go down in, in so, time. so let me make the following comment and let, let's see if we if you agree with me or not i modeling the universe i agree we should not do that that's uh, i need to get a t-shirt that says uh don't boil the ocean tim can we get that please so because that would be literally boiling i think the i ocean. made a mock-up for that but you didn't like it because it had your face really big on it <laughs> i think i remember that yeah okay so <laughs> modeling the universe hell no right you're boiling the ocean i like what you said the core concepts are important and we should focus on modeling what those core concepts are. And the question is, how do we identify those core concepts? Their methodology, we need to figure out what those core concepts are. And then literally, I think we should start with core, meaning a handful, mm -hmm. one, two, three. I mean, what is an order? What is a customer? What is a user? Like, like the most important things that you actually are looking into, like uh, at, at data.world, we travel, we, we have something called CRAS, customer real active days. We need to have a definition for customer. Let's go understand that. And, and, and the attribute, let's go model what the customer is and attributes around that. That's what we should be modeling. Later on, there are other things that we may want to go model. We'll go model them once we get actually business requirements about that. Otherwise, we'll focus just on modeling the core concepts. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and like it's, it's it your question of how do we define them? It's basically the things you get asked about all the time. Like it's, it's what is it that you get frustrated that you have to keep dealing with? Just like, okay, revenue is probably important. We need to have that or active users or, you know, if you're bookings, if you're Airbnb or rides or Uber or whatever, like the thing that is clearly the kind of core piece of this business that everybody's always asking, like, I need rides for this region. I need rides for like, okay, just do that. And then I think the, the other thing I would say is it takes some discipline and this is not easy, but it takes some discipline to not overextend that where I think that there is, and this is one of the reasons I think like the look ML approach is, is incomplete basically is say someone now asks a question sort of extends beyond that. Like if you're primarily delivering these things through having something where you have to kind of model it within the, the one model or rule them all, then you end up overextending that model because your only way to actually answer questions that are kind of infrequent, but you need to actually get an answer to. So you may not care about rise, but somebody may be like, I need to know the number of, you know, support tickets filed through this thing. And you're like, you never actually care about that, but because we got to do it now, we got to figure out a way to like tack that onto this model. Some of those things just don't, you don't need to make sort of core metrics. Like it's, it's stick to the main things you have and let everything else kind of be, be something that becomes like an ad hoc thing. 
instead of every kind of a question like, okay, that's a new dashboard. Like eventually if you have, if you have a thousand core metrics, you have no core metrics. Yeah. As you, as you're evolving things for edge cases and things like that, then you have to touch the thing that's working and you don't necessarily want to be doing that all the time. I, I think what's interesting, I have an observation. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on it. And then I have a, a question for you um, is like, I find myself also similar to you drawn to the DBT side and like, Hey, can we bring more of this into the DBT side? You know, with the caveats that, that you've noted and that we've already kind of talked about, because one of the things that I like is that it feels like then you're just thinking about a translation, like, Hey, like data exists like this. I want it to look like this. The way that you think about DBT today is a translation that results in sort of a new table or new view, right? Mm -hmm. But what if that translation doesn't need to result in a new table or view and instead is just an interpretation done at query time? Well, it's 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 just a, it's pretty much the same SQL. It's just not manifesting itself into into an output, right? Mm -hmm. And that just seems like clean. It seems interesting. The the one caveat I have to that, which gets a little bit into our conversation that we had about modeling or my concern, not caveat, is that like one thing that so I, I used to use Looker back in the day. We don't use it currently. But um, uh, one of the features that I liked there was that like when you change something in the model, um, then it would say, hey, you're going to break like a bunch of dashboards. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you could go and essentially repair that connection by saying, oh, well, now it's this instead of that. Mm -hmm. And you could go and actually repair all those different semantic mappings, right, or those connections. Um, and, and that's because the BI tool knows about all the things, mm -hmm. right? And DBT doesn't know about all the things, right? And so uh, I don't know that, that I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. And, and my next question kind of piggybacks off of this, which is like headless BI, like what's that? And does that matter? Does that kind of start to get replaced by this metrics concept? So, okay, on the, on the first question, yeah, that's a problem. And that's a problem, not just in sort of like the, the metrics to BI layer or whatever. It's like a problem across one of the changes with sort of the modern data stack is modular. And that's like very much the way that people talk about it. And it's like sort of the, the unbundling of BI or the delamination of the data warehouse or whatever you want to call it, like we're stripping off a lot of pieces. So we have ingestion tools, you have a warehousing tool, you've got transformation tools, you've got metrics tools, you've got BI, you've got analytics tools, you've got catalogs and observability and the whole thing. And they're all separate, which on one hand is great. We get like better products and they can kind of talk to each other and we can pick and choose what we like. Uh, but on the other hand, we often use those things kind of as one product, like to the end user, to like the person looking at the dashboard, there's a whole bunch of stuff sitting underneath this thing. And that's all the same to them. So like Shopify is one of Mode's customers. One of the early pieces of feedback we heard from them was mode and data became synonymous. So mode's like a BI tool, basically. It became synonymous, like, and, and sort of good or bad for us in a way where if people saw value in data, they're like mode, mode did that. And it's like, we did some of it, but there was a lot of other tools behind it that didn't get the credit. But also if something went wrong, it was our fault. Like it was, there was, we actually, there was a time I was visiting their, their, their office. Um, this was a few years ago and AWS went down. So like, you know, one of the few times in the last five or six years, like, I think it was like S3 broke. And like if S3 breaks, the internet breaks. Um, so mode broke. Uh, and so it was like, I was in the office and this happened and it was kind of this like catastrophic thing. The internet, nothing works. And to a lot of people, it's like modes down. I can't do my work. And it's like, yeah, mode sort of is down. But like the whole world is down. But like as the front end of all of that, that's what, what people saw. And my, the reason I bring this up is it's all one product to most people. Like all this entire stack is one thing and it doesn't work like one thing. The tools are not aware of each other. Like, we as the builders of it have built it to carve out our individual little niches, whereas the users of it see it all as like one thing and they want a unified experience that makes sense. We're like, I changed the thing in DBT and the BI tools are aware of it. Or I changed my five trend model and something knows about it. Or if like, you know, the pipeline from Stitch breaks and my observability tool needs to know or whatever. And we haven't figured out how to do any of that yet, um, where things are sort of loosely aware of each other through the warehouse, basically, where everything sort of talks to each other in a very uh, like blunt way by writing tables to the warehouse. And we sort of attempt to read from one another's tables, but there's not really any direct communication between tools. And so I don't know exactly the way to do that. I think it's problematic. I, 
this was actually in the last post I had, there's like sort of a, I think there's an option here, but it's, it's problematic to say like every modern data stack tool integrate with every other tool because that's, everybody has a hundred bilateral B, uh, a, like integrations through APIs to build that will never happen. But that's an effect what we need to do to solve this problem that you're describing of like, yeah, nothing's really aware of what's going on. And so one part breaks and the whole thing kind of starts to like lose itself because it's not sure what's going on. So uh, I don't know if you see me smiling because that was kind of the next topic based on your last post on standards. So mm -hmm. I know we're, we're not at the lightning round yet, but standards, yes or no? No. So therefore, every, the, who's going to win is the the tool application who who spins up as much connectors to all these things out there? Uh, yeah, like, I mean, I, this is in not don't not to extend this beyond this this conversation. Uh, when it comes to standards in the data stack, I'm like a brutal capitalist. And the, the way standards emerge is somebody wins. Um, it is not that we get together and define a standard. So so Fivetran, for instance, uh, Fivetran did not attempt to do anything with Stan. Fivetran was basically like, great, we know tools people want to use. We'll go do the hard work and integrate with all their APIs. And like, God bless them, they did the hard work and integrated with a whole bunch of APIs that nobody wants to do. And now they're all rich for it. Um, as a result of that, however, they, I don't know if this has actually gone anywhere and maybe it hasn't, but they have started to push companies and like SaaS products to define, the, define their APIs in particular ways. They're like, you should do this with your API. You should paginate in this way. You should give bulk API access in this way. And I don't know if Fivetran has the leverage to do that yet, but like if you are launching a SaaS product, that is now a thing to think about is like people are probably don't want to get the data out of it. I don't want to give them a way to export it. Why don't I just like integrate it with Fivetran because everybody already uses. I'll just do this in a way that makes sense to them. And a standard emerges from that because Fivetran sort of like bent the market to, or like could, I don't know if this has not happened yet, but Fivetran could sort of bend the market to their will on that because they have defined that. DBT, I think is the same where DBT is becoming a standard that people are building tools on top of out of no effort to be a standard out of just being a popular product. Um, and so, no, I, I don't think like one of the reasons that the, the post you're referencing was about sort of metadata standards and like, should we have a common way of defining metadata? It's like, sure, you know, and I would love to be a professional baseball player, but like neither of those things are going to happen. Like the way that's going to have to happen is somebody comes along and just does a really good job of this such that we all just want to integrate with that product. We build our sort of metadata presentation to work with that thing. And eventually it becomes the default that we all use. And like, we're not going to get together and agree on this. And then you sort of like consortium on this as a pipe dream. So all these uh, current open source or standards, I mean, I mean, we see Apache and we've all Atlas and Egria, and then like there's open lineage and open metadata. And then, uh, I mean, I, I, I read something the other day, there, all this stuff, people are wasting their time. I don't think those things will become standards. Um, that's not necessarily well, standard wasting, wasting time. time. Well, I think there is there is useful things that come out of that. Like it, we learn things, and I don't know exactly what that is. And I, you know, I would be hesitant to say like those things are a total waste of time. I think if if it is, the whole point of them is only to create a standard that the entire world agrees to. Yeah, that's a waste of time. Um, but you know, there, there are there are people, for instance, who have built visualization frameworks with the attempt to say this is the new web standard for building visualizations has it happened absolutely not but do people create things in the process of that that's like a useful evolution in how we do visualizations sure um so you know i think stuff like open metadata open lineage all that kind of thing does it help push useful evolutions along it could it could be a thing that a product actually adopts and somebody picks up and says this is the way we want to do it because they've thought about this in a really smart way um, but does that on its own become a standard? No, I don't think so. Okay. So, um, this is interesting to see what, uh, the folks, I mean, we're, I talked to all these standards folks and, and I've been part of standards. So I, I've had experience in, in, in successful ones and unsuccessful ones. So I, 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 sometimes I wake up and I'm with you and sometimes I wake up and I'm like, no, I think there really needs, so I think there really needs to be one. If it all, if we had the ideal one, we would all agree to it. Yes. Life would be great. Yes, you can become a baseball player, uh, but um, I understand that it's not always as rosy. But another topic quickly, 
because you know we've been already talking for 45 minutes i, I think we're just scratching the surface here uh data apps yes so I truly believe that we need to start thinking about the date. I mean, just on our phone, you have things on your phone, the apps like this, this is mm -hmm. how we should start building things. I believe that we start, we can be able to go build these data apps very quickly because you start defining not just things like the metrics layer, but you start building, it's the defining these entity semantic layers mm -hmm. little by little, and then anybody can just start using this. Uh, and you also, one of your other posts kind of alluded to almost the reverse ETL it was kind of confusing. Like it will go away or they, or, or, or they won't go away if they are the ones who are going to be adapting kind of, or being the, the, the means of being able to go create these data apps. All right. Um, you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So data apps, first of all, I, my definition of a data app is basically what you're saying. It is, it is like an application is meant to solve a problem that uses data at the core of solving that problem. Um, that is distinct from sometimes people talk about data apps is like a shiny dashboard. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a dashboard with some toggles and stuff that's interactive. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's a dashboard, but it's not really a data app in the way that I would define it. Like to me, a data app is, I was, I was just, uh, talked to the folks at Epo, which is like a experimentation platform. Um, it basically like Epo to me is a data app. It's, it sits on top of your warehouse. It is an application designed for helping you understand your experiments and do a bunch of stuff with them. Uh, data is core of it, but the main problem is like experiments and data is just the way they do it. That I think it's hard to build those now because you have to build sort of native integrations with the warehouse and stuff like that. Um, I think that we could get much closer to that if, if the warehouse, people started to talk, talk about sort of building stuff on top of like the data layer. I'm not really sure what the data layer actually is, I think with things like a metrics layer and sort of entities and stuff, it starts to actually be a little bit more of a platform that you can build stuff on top of. And so like I've used this like operating system analogy before, kind of like that, where it's like, okay, it's easy to just install something directly on it rather than like having to basically build an entire product that integrates with Snowflake and BigQuery and every other database in the world. I think that's possible. I think that's like, that is a reasonable path for some things to go. I certainly think there will be some companies that do that. Um, there are caveat. There, there are two other things I'd say about this. One is on the reverse ETL side, which is reverse ETL to me is the wrong path for like reverse ETL talks about basically being a path from the warehouse into to apps. Yes, however, if you are a data app, you would presumably build it directly on top of the warehouse or whatever layer is like the thing that you can build on top of, not go through a reverse ETL tool. So I think in that way, reverse ETL tools are not a platform. However, Salesforce ain't changing what they do. Like Salesforce is Salesforce and we're all going to use Salesforce for a while. And so you need reverse ETL to like do that. Like th there is a long transition period that may be a permanent transition period for which there's a lot of tools that do not get built on top of this data layer and reverse ETL tools have like a very big gap to fill, to fill that. So I think there's like space for that, that space um, or space for those products uh, for, for quite some time. Yeah. Last point though, I'd say about the apps, the one place to me where I am a little bit skeptical about this is unlike iPhone apps, iPhone apps, the, the market for an iPhone app is like 7 billion people. The market for a data app, not that many. And so the economics there don't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and this is, I think, a problem for data tools in general is every data tool costs 20 to 50K. And we need 10 now. And so like what was supposed to be a affordable and easy to set up stack now costs half a million dollars. We're like kind of back to where we started. And so... Data apps could solve that by like, if they're easier to build, they'll be cheaper, but the market's just not that big. You can't charge a dollar for them. It can't be like your phone where you install one, you pay five bucks for it. The app economically can make that work because they have a million people who install it. Like it's just not that big of a market for it. Yeah, you can charge a lot more, but like there's some challenges there that, that don't quite make the analogy work. There's also like security questions. You can't just go in and like install a bunch of stuff on your warehouse without some IT people getting really upset. So structurally maybe it makes sense kind of in practice uh, we'll see that is a very interesting perspective and you know just to reverse a little bit when you were talking about different kinds of data apps i actually thought it was interesting that you gave epo as an example because i think a lot of folks do kind of think of data apps as like oh they're kind of like custom dashboards or they're like you know uh, custom built apps that are using the, the you know the data on the back end but thinking of alternative use cases that are data driven, that are built on top of the data, things like Epo, that, that that's an uh, I think a useful additional lens on all of this that expands it a little bit in terms of how you think about data apps. Yeah, my, my view is, and this is uh, this was something that that 
Martin Casado, who's a partner at Andreessen and on the boards of all these companies, uh, he talked about, I think, six months or so ago. And, and I think it's, I don't know if I sort of quite buy it as, as aggressively as he does, but I think it's generally sort of the right direction is a lot of SaaS apps get rebuilt in this way. And so you can think of this as there's a fire truck driving by going the wrong way down the street. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can think of this as like, there was a company I, I uh, discovered recently called Ashby, um, which I think is like a, it's like an ATS, like an application tracking system for recruiters, basically built on top of data. So the idea is do your recruiting and your application tracking through not like just a kind of a CRM type of system, do one where the primary focus of it is understanding how people move through those pipelines. And so that to me seems like the kind of thing we'd see a lot more of is, Oh, build an ATS on top of the data layer, build a CRM on top of it, build design tools, build all, like, all that stuff. Yeah. What happens if we integrated them with the rest of like the data that an organization has? That makes sense. Yeah. That's, and product analytics kind of tools are kind of moving in that direction too. Like yeah. oh, your data already lives in your warehouse and you're using segment. Like, wouldn't you want to do product analytics right on top of that? That kind of thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Oh man, we can, we got to do a two hour session with you. We got, we got to have you back. This is awesome. Part two at some point. <laughs> part, part two after you keep writing more of your blog posts and we'll, and, and because there's more things and actually we didn't really fight. So, <laughs> um, so, all right, we're going off to oh, Brandon. our lightning round. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I want to, I do say, I, would, I want to be able to have a very different position from you and, and really write a blog post okay. uh, if that happens. But, um, I, I think us be on the same, get on the same page. This is, this is, this is great. I think we need to have, have people heading towards the same direction. I, so I haven't, I haven't written any posts about data catalogs yet. I'll save that one for you. Ooh. Oh, okay. Okay. Fun. all right. All right. Well, let's, let's move on to our lightning round, which is uh, presented by data.world, the world's only truly cloud native data catalog. So I'll kick it off with, will the metrics layer and the semantic layer, will this all merge together? Yes or no? Yes, I think that's kind of one of the same. All right. Tim. Second question. Um, we talked about data apps. Can data apps flourish without the metrics layer? Uh, yes. With the caveat that there will be a lot fewer of them because of the economic problem that they're very expensive to build. Mm. It's got to be right. easier and faster to build. All right. Uh, will... Analytics engineers, we haven't we didn't have a chance to talk about personas and people are doing this. Will the analytics engineers be the future semantic modelers? Yes. Yes. Any quick uh, <laughs> extension on that? No, I, I, the, I think analytics engineering in general is, is a good direction that the space is going. Um, I think it, it, I, my concern about it is it is encompassing too much and it becoming, say you have a world where you have semantic layers or metrics layers or whatever, and then you've got data apps, becomes the, the entire data team's responsibility is to be the analytics engineers that define the models that go into those apps. And there's a bunch of people who are just consuming those apps with no kind of like actual analyst in that picture. Um, that, that I think is a dangerous world. Like no matter how good the app is, it's hard to do the analysis. Like there's analysis that has to be done that is not a problem of any sort of tool. It's a problem of just making sense of what you're looking at. And so, so tools like Epo, uh, good tool potentially for building experiments and looking at, or like helping people understand experiments. Inevitably, there will be a need to have an analyst sometimes look at that to make sense of it. And like, I think if we, if we go too far with analytics engineering and analytics, like that kind of structure, we start to think of it as like, all right, great. We're still just throwing things over a wall. We're not throwing a BI tool over the wall anymore. We're throwing a bunch of data apps, but like there is at some point some kind of translation that needs to be done to actually make sense of these things. That, that's a that's a good nuanced perspective, and it actually makes me think about um, our episode we had a couple of weeks ago, Juan, with Sarah Catanzaro from Amplify Partners, where she was talking about the importance of of analysts and and how we can't lose that, and in fact we need to be spreading analysts out to more parts of the organization and more parts of convers yeah. and more more conversations. Um, Last uh, uh, lightning round question for you. Um, will this whole advent of data mesh, which we were very good, we tried not to talk about it, we ended up not talking about <laughs> it, uh, although it seems to come up all the time. Um, will a data mesh approach accelerate the need for the metrics layer? Um, 
No, I think that actually kind of works against it. Uh, though I don't, I dip like oh, data mesh. Um, okay, so my, my very quick take on the data mesh is the the as it is defined as like the sort of academic paper says this is a data mesh and this is what it must be. That to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like I don't really get one. I don't understand it. Like I just don't. I'm not smart enough to get it. Uh, but two, it's like there's a there's a version of it where it is basically you are building these sort of like data. I don't remember what they're called, the like quantums or something, and they're kicked out to the organization, and the organization like consumes them. And that to me is basically what we're describing as you have these data apps that everybody sort of consumes who are the domain experts and like the analysts are just the responsible for kind of maintaining the data thing. That to me doesn't work. However, there is what I've called like the soft version of the data mesh, uh, which is I was talking to someone who, uh, to the, the person who runs analytics at Flexport, and this is basically what it sounds like they've implemented, which is essentially just a distributed analytics engineer. Like basically what they're saying is there's an analytics engineer that has a domain that they live in. So if I am a marketing analytics engineer, I just really understand what a lead means and things that people are trying to do with it. And so I can properly like model the lead data to, to fit the need without having to think about this like globally. That makes sense. Like, but then we're just back to kind of the age old question of like distributed or embedded teams or like embedded or centralized. Like, okay, yeah, fine. And, and instead of embedding an analyst, you're embedding an analytics engineer. Okay, sure. I think that's fine. And that like sort of removes a little bit of the need for like the centralization of metrics because presumably you have these experts that are sort of fighting around the company that can do it. But like, that's not really that revolutionary to me. That's basically just, again, let's embed analysts. Okay, now let's embed analytics engineers who can help them get the data assets they need. Yep, very, very quickly, I, th I, work, I think we're kind of on the same page, but um, some nuances, but next conversation. All right, T, 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 Tim, take it away with our takeaways. Oh my goodness. There's so much interesting and good stuff here. Um, I'll keep it to just my top highlights, which is that you said the metrics layer should be a thing. You know, we've got all these business metrics and, and even really these entities that we're interacting with in our reporting, in our analytics, and the things that we're trying to take action on. And, and these metrics can be defined differently depending on who you're talking to, how they're using them, and which system you're looking at, which dashboard you're looking at, which chart in the same dashboard you're looking at. Um, and the metrics layer is really thinking about how do we move some of this logic upstream? How do we create more standardization so that, um, so that we can really communicate better, right? We can collaborate with each other in a way that isn't so painful uh, and, and have more semantically meaningful interactions with each other when it comes to data. Um, second thing is data apps are obviously becoming more of a thing. Um, you know, your response on the lightning round, the, uh, the metrics layer can help accelerate it. Um, but you know, data apps are going to probably be a thing regardless. And, um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Don't just think of it like these dashboards that are just a little fancier or a little more custom, you know, applications, leveraging your data under the hood, even things like EPO, uh, experimentation platforms can be data apps that can be really useful. Uh, what about you, Juan? What are your takeaways? So much. Let's go. Governance, interesting. We want to make sure to understand what the definition of that. What is the calculation? We really don't care how it was calculated. Just come up with the definition. Make sure we all know because go figure spending on that time, you're just wasting our time. Uh, the language of the metrics is going to be either or possibly like this LocalML fork or a DBT fork. Who knows? Pros and cons on each one. When it comes to modeling, we should focus on what are these core concepts and what are they? The ones you get asked all the time. What is a user? Revenue. If you're Airbnb, you're looking talking about bookings. If you're uh, Uber, you're talking about rides. Um, standards. If your position is no, just go do the hard work. I guess those folks who do the hard work are the ones who are probably going to go win and people are going to go follow them. Ben, back to you quickly. Two questions. What's your advice? Who should we invite next? uh advice i don't know but my my advice and takeaway is kind of the same which apparently if you travel to germany every room is full of fine wine so i guess we should all just travel to germany more often <laughs> uh, uh people uh people should invite next i got i got three um because we spent a lot of time having like these sort of frankly self-indulgent conversations about tooling and stuff like that like that's not the hard work the hard work is like building teams and like actually understanding people and helping solve their problems. I am not good at that, um, but I know three people who very much are. Uh, and so it'd be interesting in these conversations. One is Caitlin Houdon. Um, one is Maura Church. 
uh, and one is Erica Louie. Uh, Caitlin works at, uh, I believe it's on one med online, online med, med ed, which is like a education tool for, um, for folks. Uh, more church runs the data team at Patreon and Erica Louie runs the data team at DBT. Uh, and they're all very good at talking about like how to actually do that part of the job, which is much harder than, than, you know, writing a bunch of ranty blog posts on the internet. Love it. Ben, Great suggestions. thank you so much. And thanks for cheers. having me. And thanks to Data Wolf for supporting us on Cal and Cocktails. Cheers. <laughs>